Okay, Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio in New York, and we've got tennis star Ben Shelton. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dan. So we're about a week after an awesome U.S. Open. We had the final. We saw Sinner versus Fritz. All good there. But to me, the highlight, Shelton Tiafo. Let's just start there. Talk to me about that epic match. Yeah, it was a, it was a cool match to be a part of, uh, for sure. You know, a rematch from last year's U.S. Open uh, quarterfinal. So unfortunate that we had to meet so early because we were clearly both playing at a really high level. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't complain playing in an atmosphere like that on Ash. Uh, some of the things that you dream about. So uh, I, was, I, I was upset, obviously, that I didn't come out on top. But um, I'm grateful for another experience there at the U.S. Open. It's my favorite tournament. Yeah, it was so cool to watch, and I think big picture, if we zoom out, you know, I'm a little older than you. Um, I've lived through this era in which there really weren't big American stars. I mean, the last big one, there was Roddick, and he had the misfortune of being in the Nadal, Federer, Djokovic era. But right. now we're seeing, on the men's and women's side, a real proliferation of U.S. stars back advancing far into the tourney, you know, pick your example. Talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, for you, you're focused on you, on Ben Shelton, but you look around and U.S. stars are, are really back at the top of the ranks, which is exciting for fans. Yeah, I think competition is great, and I think competition is what makes us better. As a country, for a while, it was the women holding the torch. Um, they always seemed to have a girl who was uh, winning a slam or getting to the finals. Uh, obviously, we had Serena for all that time, and then we had Sloan who won a slam, and Maddie Keyes who's been in the finals, Jen Brady and uh, Sophia Cannon, now Coco is a Grand Slam champion. So the guys were kind of kind of slacking compared to the girls for a while. Um, but I think that that competition has really raised our level. We have a group of guys who are all friends, um, similar in age, and in the top 15, top 20 in the world. And so I think that when you get a, a group like that and create that kind of atmosphere, that's what breeds success. So I'm happy with where uh, U.S. tennis is, is heading and certainly excited to be a part of it. Before a big U.S. Open, we had Olympic tennis. Can we talk a little bit about your mindset there with opting out? Uh, what would it take for you to play at the Olympics next time? Yeah, I think there's a few things. Um, adding, it, it's only my second year on tour. It feels like I've been out there longer, but I'm still trying to figure things out. I'm playing tournaments for the first time that I've never never played before, so I'm just trying to get used to it. And uh, adding another um, surface change at, at that part of the season, so close to the U.S. Open and uh, going back to Europe again, um, I was just, I was honestly too tired, too exhausted to do it. And I think that it's important that you put together a schedule where you don't get injured and you're able to maintain your level throughout the year. And I think if I played the Olympics, that just wasn't possible for me um, this year. And uh, in terms of what it would take to play, I think LA 2028 is much more enticing because it is in the US. It's on the same surface as the US Open. And uh, that'd be one that I'd really look forward to um, if, if, if I were to make it. I think Brisbane in 2032 is a little different story yeah. <laughs> going to the other half of the world, but we'll see. Yeah, that's some big travel. Uh, that's smart. Makes sense. Let's talk about what's up next on your schedule. We've got the Labor Cup coming up in Berlin. Really cool event. Uh, been around a few years now. You know, we had the chance to talk to Roger Federer's agent, Tony Godsick, about it. You know, Federer is going to be there more as an ambassador, second year of Federer not playing. But they got a lot of top players who are coming out, including you. Uh, talk to me about how you think about something like the Labor Cup, obviously different from a major. Yeah, I think uh, it's an important event. It's, it's a big event. And you see how many guys in the top 10, top 15 are playing. Um, they care about this. And I think it's a, a great event for tennis. You get to see the guys in a team-like atmosphere um, for one time out of, out of the whole year where we're only thinking about ourselves, playing for ourselves. You get to see the reactions of the guys on the bench um, in a little bit more 
relaxed setting, cheering for their guys, goofing off. Um, it's, it's something that I, I, I really enjoyed last year, uh, being the first time that I played. So um, it's just one of those great weeks for me that I really enjoy and kind of reminds me why I love and, and enjoy this sport. I think playing for, for Johnny Mack is another uh, really cool thing that I've enjoyed. Uh, I think that he's a, he's a great guy, great tennis mind, and just such a personality. So it, it's sad that this is going to be his last year at the Labor Cup, but obviously we have Andre Agassi coming in, not too, not too shabby either. So uh, he'll be there in Berlin as well, kind of shadowing uh, Johnny Mack and, 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 and seeing how the whole Labor Cup process works. But yeah, I'm excited to hopefully compete on this team for years to come. For an event like that, does it feel a lot lower pressure, and does that make it more fun to play? Um, I think knowing that you can rely on your teammates and obviously you want to win every match you play very badly but at the end of the day the team can still get the job done even if you take a loss uh, I think I, I enjoy that part of of the format obviously whenever you're in a ATP tournament and, and you lose a match you're out that's it done um, so I think it takes a little bit of pressure off knowing that you could rely on your teammates sometimes to, to get to to get the job done. I mentioned Roger Federer who co-created the Labor Cup and obviously uh, he was with Nike for so long, had that iconic RF logo and then, and I remember covering it very closely as a sports business guy, uh, moved over to Uniqlo and then was able to add his deal with On. You're repping your, your On brand, you got the hoodie on. Talk to me a little bit about that part of your identity, the on deal, you know, repping it on the court, but also where could that go in terms of off the court? Yeah, I think it was a, it was a really interesting opportunity for me because you have a lot of big companies, um, not throwing any shade, but you, you go to the U.S. Open and you see uh, the guys in Nike and there's 20 guys wearing the same thing, or Adidas, 20 guys wearing the same thing. On, at first it was just me, now it's two guys wearing the same thing. So um, the ability to kind of grow with the company, I think was really cool. I was the first uh, tennis player, that active tennis player that they signed. Obviously they had, they had Roger with the shoe and I guess I was the first head to toe um, tennis player. So it's, uh, it's really special for me and it's been great to work with those guys. I don't think many people who work with clothing companies uh, get as much access as On has given me, um, just being able to interact with the higher ups in the company, the founders, the, the CEO, I've just had so many cool opportunities and uh, in terms of off court you see uh, all, all the On collaborations they've done in the higher fashion and, and streetwear world. Uh, that's the type of stuff that really excites me, you know, the collaboration with Loewe. Um, I'm wearing that stuff all the time, and I, I just think that it's a very versatile brand and, and something that uh, I like to be a part of. Yeah, I know. I've been really impressed with how the company, which was known first for running, has really succeeded in, in going into tennis, too. Talk to me a little bit about any other business interests or long-term endeavors? You know, you've got to be pretty focused on tennis here, and you've still got a lot of great years in, uh, in tennis. But, you know, more and more athletes are obviously thinking about their off-the-court, off-the-field business ventures, portfolios. What are you eyeing? What are you into in terms of uh, your off-the-court brand approach and business ambitions? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I think that it's something that evolves for me you know uh, with all I've been able to do in my life so far it's hard to believe that I'm only 21 but um, I know that I have a lot of time to think about those type of things obviously uh, first and foremost it's m most important to have the right advisors around you which I have you talked about Tony Godsick uh, uh, Roger Federer's agent and at the at the same company Alessandro Santalbano who's my, or, or they're both my agents, but Alessandro's the one that I work with every single day. And those guys are, have done a great job with growing my brand and giving me business opportunities here and there and opening doors for me that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So 
that those type of things will continue to to evolve. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not just somebody who only focuses on tennis. I like the business world, I like the finance world, and uh, but but the things that I like and dislike are still are still changing. So I think that um, I'm not someone to rush into those type of things, mm -hmm. but there's, there's definitely some things that interest me. What do you think uh, Ben Shelton's brand is? Obviously there's, <laughs> yeah. beyond that. Um, you know, I think that my brand isn't just one thing. Um, I, I think for me, my on-court brand and off-court brand are two different things. I think on-court I can be a fearless competitor. Um, I'm not scared of anybody or, or any moment. I just love to go out there and compete. And uh, I'm going to try to be a dog while I'm doing it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not out there to try to be friendly or win people over or make people like me. Um, I'm out there to, to compete, and I think that a lot of the things that I do on the court are also entertaining because I love having fun while doing it. Um, I think my demeanor off the court is much different than my demeanor on the court. I think uh, kind of that uh, wired, uh, loud competitor that's on the court is, I'm, I'm a bit more mellow off the court. I'm, I'm always smiling. I like. I like talking to people, hanging around, you know, cracking jokes. That's just kind of how I am. So I think that I can uh, be that classy, respectful guy who's not as not as loud or, or I'm not a loud or obnoxious guy off the court. But I think that when I get on the court, I'm I'm able to flip the switch and and do the things that help me compete the best. Nice, nice. Well, I got two more questions for you, tennis specific. So. We talked about McEnroe and Agassi coming in with the Labor Cup. Talk to me a little bit just about coaching in tennis and you know how you've worked with uh, the coaches on that side of things and, and if you think things are kind of changing and evolving in that way. Yeah, tennis is different these days because you can coach your player on the court. When, when you're sitting on the sidelines, you can give them signals, you can talk to them in between every point, uh, kind of help them through the process, which is different from the way things were in the past. And I think coaching is a, is a huge part of, of tennis. Um, my dad's kind of been my sole coach my whole career, and we work really well together. That's just something that's always clicked between us. Um, but I think coaching is a very delicate job in tennis. It's tough because it's such a mental sport. Um, any little change in, in the mind can drastically uh, change performance on the court. So I think that really knowing your player and having that continuity of having a player-coach relationship that's uh, lasted a long, long time re really helps for tennis, especially for me. And uh, yeah, getting coached by Johnny Mack has been a, a, a treat for me, you know, that one week out of the year last year and this year just to kind of see the way that he sees the game. Um, he's left-handed, uh, just like me, and uh, he, he has such a passion for the sport, and especially the Laver Cup. His idol growing up was Rod Laver, so it's something that he doesn't take for granted, the spot that he has, and he puts all his effort into it. So a lot of respect for Johnny Mack. Yeah, and of course, even though they can be kind of close to you, talk to you, do some hand motions, can't go in and play for you. you know? That's so. true. Yeah, you're, out, so there, you're out there on your own. Right, right. Uh, and then lastly, you know, as a tennis fan and viewer, I'm almost still thinking about that moment in Cincy maybe a month ago with that crazy call. And you can rewatch the clip endless times and still come up with different opinions. A, a match point hinged on it. But it kind of prompted a new conversation around video review and replay and um, using Hawkeye and, and what should be done, what shouldn't be done when we talk about officiating and, and hard to tell live bounces like that. Do you have a take on what happened there? Yeah, I think, I think the video review 100%, uh, they should have it at every tournament. It's just, there's too much at stake. We're, we're a too advanced sport. Um, we have a Hawkeye, Hawkeye Live system that can call every single bounce on the court, every shot. but. 
we can't review whether a guy hit the ball down off of his racket right. into the ground or uh, up and over. You know, I have my own thoughts about what should have happened in that moment, but that's <laughs> beside the fact um, that it, we should do a better job and have that, uh, what do they say, VAR at, at every tournament. And that's something that I think that they're working on and that, that needs to be worked on because, uh, like I said, there's, there's too much at stake. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot of technological changes come to the sport in the next 10, 15 years. The other interesting thing at, uh, about Cincinnati was their Hawkeye system was actually malfunctioning a lot throughout the week. So that makes you almost also kind of question the, the, the line calling system of if it's correct every time or if it's making a lot of mistakes. Yeah, and I think you can never fully get rid of humans either. Right. And, and shouldn't. Um, we talked about US Open, we talked about Labor Cup. Let's end on this. Your favorite tournament, major or not, to play? Um, can I give you favorite tournament major and favorite tournament non-major? Okay. Okay. Uh, for major, I'm going to go U.S. Open. Nothing like it. I'd say Wimbledon is a close second, but uh, something about the U.S. Open, especially being American, is just a little bit different for me. Um, for non-Grand Slams, I would probably go with Tokyo. Uh, my first tournament that, that I won out here on tour and uh, yeah, a, a really cool event. It was one of my favorite cities that I've been to and uh, I'm excited. That'll be the first tournament that I play after the Labor Cup. So looking forward, a lot to look forward to in the next couple of weeks. Ben Shelton, big in Tokyo. I like it. <laughs> ben, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me, Dan.